I forgot I was gonna set up some like elevator music or something for the beginning, but I forgot. <laughs> Okay, so we just get started and then um, Ava, you can let people in if more people join us. Let me find my document here. Great, so um, as we start, I just wanna remind everybody that if you're not speaking, if you could have your sound off uh, and then uh, that way you won't be picked up on the recording. Um, we shall begin. So um, hello everybody, whoops. Sorry, my screen just adjusted funny. Hello, everybody. My name is Curtis Hidamasa Nickerson Arima, and I am the chair of the Jewelry Metal Arts Program. And on behalf of the Jewelry Metal Arts and Fine Arts Programs at CCA, I'd like to welcome you to the April 19th, Spring 2022 Jewelry Metal Arts BFA Conversations. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, California College of the Arts is located in Huchin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, on the unceded territories of the Chechenyo and Ramatush Ohlone people. I encourage you all to learn about the indigenous people who have continuously lived upon the land since time immemorial, Learning, learn from their rich histories and their present practices in the areas that you now occupy and where your ancestors are from. As we start, I'd like to honor these original stewards of the land. Welcome you all. I want to honor your ancestors, those who are with us today and those who have passed on. Today, we're celebrating four jewelry metal arts seniors at California College of the Arts. Um, we have Olivia Chuyue Wang, Beverly Jingha Lue, Mitchell Shim, and Mesli Mercado. I am so proud of all of them. They've completed their education through so many challenges and changes. They've moved through the pandemic with their education switching from fully, on, uh, fully online to then hybrid and now fully in person again. They've interacted with their peers and their faculty in new and sometimes difficult and sometimes rewarding ways. The nimbleness and adaptability they've acquired during their BFA experience will serve them well in their careers as artists. I congratulate them on coming to the end of their chapter in their education. For today's events, each student will be introduced by our faculty. Then the BFA candidate will give a 10 minute presentation. After each presentation, our uh, guest respondent will have 10 minutes to provide feedback and answer, ask questions. Please note that unfortunately we don't have time for public questions and answers today, but you're welcome to drop comments and affirmations in the chat. Um, our guest respondent today is Olivia Shi. Olivia is a contemporary jeweler, artist, and writer. Uh, she's based in Oakland, California, born in the U.S. and raised in Taiwan. She's interested in the cultural nuances that can be explored through wearable sculpture. She holds a BFA in creative writing from Columbia University and a BA, BFA in jewelry metal arts from California College of the Arts here. In addition to running her eponymous jewelry business, Olivia writes for Metalsmith Magazine and for Art Jewelry Forum. Welcome, Olivia. Uh, to start off our presenters, our senior adjunct professor, David Cole will introduce our first presenter. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. Thank you, Curtis. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Chiyue Wong, who also goes by the name Olivia. She was born in 1992 in Shenyang, the capital city of Liaoning province. Her mother is a middle school teacher and her father owns a petrol station. 
Olivia has always been an excellent student and at the top of her class, sometimes even her grade. She was often the one called on to decorate the large mural board at the back of her class with drawings and texts that related to different themes which changed every month. Paintings and drawings of landscapes and cartoon figures were her favorites, but they always had to take a back seat to her academics. Olivia writes in her artist statement that at that time, she was a real perfectionist, wanting everything to be just right. Her parents had very focused expectations for which, uh, which did not include being an artist, even though that was something she loved. When she graduated high school, she went to Manchester, England to study the prerequisites for a business degree, politics, economics, history, and more. But what she really loved was visiting museum collections and she had a real eye for jewelry design and metal sculpture. By 2013, these tensions over what was expected of her and what she really wanted came to a head and she moved to Vancouver, Canada she attended a community college where she studied baking and pastry arts. When she graduated, she visited a painting studio and considered learning oil painting, but her teacher had picked up on her great attention to detail and fine motor skills. So she suggested that Olivia investigate metalsmithing instead. That's when she decided to come to CCA. I find it very interesting that Olivia has studied both jewelry design and pastry making. They each focus on creating exquisite morsels to delight our senses. They use color, texture, rare and precious materials to create something special and celebratory. But as Olivia has aged and matured as an artist, her focus on perfection has made way for an embrace of imperfection. She now recognizes that the state of nature is often in flux and capturing the spontaneity of the moment in all its facets is much truer to the way we live our lives. Her degree show is a series of small sculptures that capture different moments in time, scenes played out in varying shapes, materials, and colors. I would like to present Chiu Yi Wong. Thank you, David. I'm going to share my screen. Can you guys see this? Hello everyone, my name is Shu Yue Wang. I go by Olivia at CCA. Today I'm going to present my thesis presentation. I was born and raised in Xinyang, a city located in the northeast part of China. As a young girl, I was curious about the world around me. Using my paint and brush, I intended to de depict the beauty of the world. With my growing interest of art, I studied drawing at the age of 10. Since then, art has slowly become an indispensable part of my life. It is the way that I can share what I see and feel with the outside world. It is also the way that I can relax and speak for my true self. On the right is a painting of flamingo, which is my favorite bird I made a few years ago. I love traveling. Traveling to me is full of surprises and wonders. When I travel to a new place, the first thing I would do is go into the local museums and galleries. I enjoy the moment standing in front of, of an artwork, staring at it, imagine how it was created. The lines, the movement, the composition and the color choices are where my inspirations come from. Sometimes it is just a splash of paint will make me wonder in the world of art. I am deeply inspired by wabi-sabi culture. In traditional Japanese aesthetics, wabi-sabi is a worldview centered on the acceptance of transience and imperfect, imperfection. The aesthetic is sometimes described as one of appreciating beauty that is imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete in nature. The philosophy of celebrating the beauty of imperfection indeed changes my way of thinking. I was a girl chasing perfection for life, art, everything. My flawed way of thinking has blurred my understanding of what perfection really is. What Wabi Sabi has taught me is to accept the incompleteness and imperfection. 
There are extraordinary beauty inside imperfect things. I now believe all things in life are in an imperfect state of flux. Change is the only constant. Everything is transient and nothing is ever complete. So let's strive not for perfection, but for doing the best we can. Therefore, my metal art pieces apply themselves to bring this idea of life philosophy to resonate with the audience. Octopus Postman is the piece which leads me to create imperfect art. It came from my childhood love of sea creatures. The octopus is personified with its tentacles to deliver many letters. The octopus postman carrier is a connection point for social relationships. The success of this work is that the movement of tentacles has a sense of dynamics. Since this is the first time I made a hollow structure made with a sheet bent and connected, I found that there were unavoidable tiny gaps in the tentacles after I finished. At this time, I did not intentionally try to make it imperfect, but I felt that these gaps gave the octopus its soul. This idea started my exploration of imperfection. The imperfection produced by chance instead made me addicted to the uniqueness caused by its randomness. Combined with my love for Japanese wabi-sabi culture, it leads me towards the path of exploring imperfection. Aging is the piece that I started to experiment with deconstruction. The different textures and colors on the left and right of aging contrast to show a sense of the tree changing as it ages. I received unexpected feedback from audiences after the work was completed. Some viewers read from it that aging is irresistible and one has to accept the laws of nature. And after the baptism of time, it brings a different kind of aesthetic. The previous version of this work was a tree, but after the shaping was completed, I felt the vitality of growth instead of aging. So I deconstructed it and made it into the current shape. The purple crystal symbolizes the mysterious power of aging. Fleeting is the work that I applied geometric shapes, which often appear in artworks and reinterpreted them in a way to depict imperfection. The changing sky is the inspiration for this work. The clouds are changing all the time and the perfect image exists only in the moment. That is why I use this color palette of blue, white, red, and yellow to represent the sky. I intentionally melted the round shape, square, and triangles to achieve an even surface. The texture of the round shape reminds me of the image of the moon at night. Splendid was my first attempt to let the material develop on its own. The feedback from the material was surprising. The edges of the metal are smooth and rounded after melting and reshaping naturally. It felt to me like the material was making its own sound rather than me giving it one. I started to trust the material and give the material the anatomy to choose the de its development rather than deliberately controlling it. The golden flower symbolizes the splendid beauty of imperfect things. In flow, I was inspired by the elements that can flow, the wind, water, and especially the fire. This piece captured the moment of a burning fire, which is constantly changing. There is not one single moment that the fire looks the same. It is powerful and strong. For this piece, I hammered each part differently and casually in a wave shape. Some parts may not look perfect. However, after combining them together, they depict the beauty of a burning fire. Night of fragments came from my dreams at night. I tend to have dreams when I go to sleep. Sometimes the dream is good and happy. Sometimes it turns into a nightmare. However, when I wake up, 
the memory of dream has shattered into fragments and become messy. I created this net of fragments to connect all my dreams at night together. No matter it is good or bad, these fragments are what make my night shiny and vivid. These are some photos of my senior installation, Da Cheng Ruo Chue, if there is a lack of perfection. Here comes to the end of my presentation. I want to give special thanks to Marilyn, Curtis, Deb, David, Joanne, and Russell. I am so grateful to have you all as my mentors who have guided me on this creative journey. Encourage me and support me no matter what. The past four years were the most wonderful time of my life. You helped me grow into an independent jewelry metal artist I can't stand to thank you enough. I will keep working on my imperfection series after graduation, working towards the path of creating art with no hesitation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you. <laughs> that was really great. It's so nice to see your work progress and how you really, uh, during the pandemic, you really stretched far to build your own studio and really work really hard during uh, our online learning. So I'd now like to invite um, Olivia Shit to the conversation uh, to respond to your presentation. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I was really drawn to your work. Uh, I think it was called Net of Fragments, the one you were talking about in your dreams. I think mm -hmm. it had a really great sense of kind of emptiness and fullness at the same time. And that was, you captured those contradictory feelings within one piece. And also you had that um, piece called Splendid with the chair. And that really also had a dichotomy, dichotomy of kind of weightiness, the weight of the chair and the lightness of the gold foil. And I feel like those two were very compelling pieces of work. Um, I do have a question for you, which is, what is your short-term and long-term plans? What are the plans that you have for the future? Um, my short-term plan is to, like, um, I wanna keep working on this imperfection series and like uh, make more pieces uh, inspired by the Wabi-Sabi culture and to accepting the beauty of imperfect things. Um, I want now like to uh, resonate with the audience about this life philosophy to accept the imperfect imperfection in life. And my long-term plan is to like open a studio and to start my own brand um, and to make more like products and jewelry pieces with like uh, this organic shape and uh, like that natural patterns and textures on top and also to emphasize this like uh, imperfection idea uh, in my works as well. So um, most of your pieces seem to be within 12 inches, I think. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, would you ever consider taking it to a larger scale, like making, for example, the chair piece, making it into 20 feet high or something like a much larger um, sculpture? Yeah, yeah, that's that's in my plan too. I want to make um, in the future if I'm making like more pieces, I really want to make them in larger scale because um, I I feel like that uh, the art pieces in larger scale it will be like more like compelling and like uh, astonishing to look at. So that's also my plan too. That's that's great because I can definitely see. Um, the piece splendid as a very large scale uh, piece of public art, or maybe I know some um, companies, businesses, hospitals, they will hire artists and ask them to make a custom artwork for their space. So I can definitely see your work within that context. And um, I found the melting texture that you're working with. This is something, melting metal is something a lot of artists, metal artists and jewelers kind of explore within their career. And I would love to see you kind of play and work with it even more to make it your own signature for it to have your specific type of look. And um, 
your work really reminded me of several different artists who play with texture. So for example, there is Reiko Ishiyama, and I will email you these names afterwards, so don't worry about writing them down. So she is a jeweler, and her works are very sculptural, and all of them have a very delicate texture to it. And once you see a piece of hers, you can easily recognize it because of the texture. Um, there's also another jeweler, Emanuela Duca, and her textures are different in that they look like molten rock or volcanic rock. And um, Lisa Hashimoto, who makes small sculptures, and often they are household items or things from daily life like ladders, tables, chairs. And what she does is interesting because she does have, she does use line, but also flat forms. And there's like a really delicate balance between the two. And I think you're touching on that with your work, Netta Fragments and also Splendid. You're kind of letting the line take over, but also having like full forms. And then finally, um, there is a younger artist called MJ Tyson. And what she does is very interesting. For one of her series, she took, um, so if someone someone passed, she would take their belongings that were mostly metal and she would melt them all together into one block. So that would be kind of like um, a way to remember the person by this physical solid piece of metal. Um, and that is something maybe you could look into as well, playing with different metal types, maybe combining things together and seeing where that takes you. Yeah, thank you so much. Ah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, our Professor Marilyn De Silva is going to introduce our next presenter. There you are. Hi, everybody. Xing Beverly Liu was born and raised in Hangzhou in Shuzhong province in China. Her interest in jewelry and gemology first began when she helped her mother select jewelry and diamond rigs. This interest and passion led her to the jewelry and metal arts program at CCA. She appreciates the encouragement she received with her studio practice, allowing her to engage in numerous expressive ways. Beverly is grateful for the sense of community she has found in our program and how we all look out for each other. Beverly is inspired by artist Courtney Madison, known for her handcrafted, intricate and large scale sculptural work focusing on climate change and the fragility of coral reefs. Beverly's artwork is also inspired by organic forms and culture identity through mixed media, using metal and clay. Her work goes from small, delicate, wearable pieces to large wall installations. Even with a difference in scale, her sensibility is evident in all of it. When asked to explain what she was hoping to convey to viewers with their work, this is what Beverly's response was. <clears throat> Quote, being a foreigner often evokes my loneliness and my sense of belonging to home. While I was creating my pieces, I was allowed to express and release this deep nostalgia. For a long time, I found my memory of past blank. Then tr I then tried to collect these fragments of my connection to home. What was the vague image in my mind about home? Is it the city, the, the culture, or my family? Through the process of making, I gathered the materials and information from home in order to fill this blank. And yet, it did not result in a concrete form but in an even more vague and abstract image of my home. May I introduce Jingheng Beverly Liu. Hi, my name is Beverly. Thank you um, 
Marilyn will introduce me and I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, it's a little bit messy, um, my screen. Um, so I'm gonna start it. Hello everyone. Welcome to my sister conversation. My name is Jing Hong Liu. You can call me Beverly. I was born and raised in Hangzhou, China. My interest in jewelry and gemology traces back to selecting jewelry and diamond rings for my mother. This interest and passion to jewelry led me to my undergraduate education. CCA has a long history of craftsmanship in its jewelry program, which induced, introduced me to the professional world of this industry as well as the craftsmanship of this practice. Not only the program encourages me to use numerous ways to express, it pushes me to explore my own identity. Now I'm going to introduce the whole content of my CSS conversation. At first, I will introduce two of my past works. After that, I will share some images of artist works that inspire me. For this conversation, I will focus more on my recent BFA show project called The Trace of Time. From my research of this practice to the installation of the whole show. Lastly, I will share my plan after I graduate. Now let's get started. I worked on both sculptures and wearable pieces. This is a sculpture piece I made two years ago. It's about the circulation between flowers, bees, and honeycomb. Beverly, project. Yes. We, we're still looking at your intro um, image. Oh, maybe. Um, can I re sharing? Maybe. Share yeah, again? maybe stop and reshare yeah. again. Mm -hmm. What about now? That's great. Yeah. Okay. So I worked on both. Uh, maybe I should repeat the. Uh, um, Did you have some images that we missed? Um, I think just the content um, here, and I will um, start from my past works. Okay, great. Okay, so I worked on both sculptures and wearable pieces. This is a sculpture piece I made two years ago. It's about the circulation between flowers, bees, and honeycomb. During this project, I practiced my band skills of metal smithing a lot because um, what you can see here, um, all of them are fabricated. The another passport I want to share is a brooch made for CCS Auckland campus. This infinity loop shape is from my Jewish studio, which is one of the most memorable places during my campus life. And more importantly, it is my starting point as a metalsmith. So this brooch symbolizes my original Beverly. intention. I'm yes. sorry to interrupt again, but the, your uh -huh. slideshow is not advancing in our screen. Um, okay. We're I looking at the honeycomb piece. I think her image is really, really big. What about now? No, I still see your honeycomb piece. Do you no. want to? No, do you yeah. want to stop sharing and then reshare? Yeah, I stopped sharing. Um, and Great, now I think okay. we have the right slide. Uh, can I just check for next slide? Sure, that's a good idea. Can you see the um, image of Roach? No. Yeah, this is the brooch with some reference images. Okay, so it's still not changing. Um, or could you share this share uh, share the screen for me? Um, I uploaded my um, presentation. Sure. To the, let me. Yeah. Let me I'm find sorry, it while I'm know. while I'm finding it. Why don't you talk about this piece, and I'll look for it and um, then share when I'm ready. Yeah, so um, this brooch symbolizes my original intention. 
become a jewelry designer, involving all my love and enthusiasm for jewelry. This infinity brooch puts me to a positive mood to solve problems and give me courage to start over after failure. Um, Curtis, should I just um, stop sharing? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. I'm just downloading your presentation now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know um, what happened here. Maybe it's because of the Canvas Wi-Fi. Um, it's not connecting very well. Yeah, that's okay. No problem. That's why. Yeah, yeah I think I um, uploaded my um, latest presentation to the folder. Can you guys see this okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you need to shrink it down though. It's really, the images are too big for the screen. Sorry, everybody. Thank you, Amy. So you want the next one? Yeah. Um... I think the um the two images for my brooch. Um, I think it's the the fifth page. Yes, it's here. Okay. It's made of silver and um, rubies. Um, Chris, could you go to next page? Um, it's for um, artist inspiration. Um, who is called Cartney Madison. Um, her handcrafts intricate and large scale sculpture works that visualize climate change through the fragile beauty of coral reefs. <laughs> could it say, yeah, I think maybe the image is too big. Um, it's difficult rolling down to the specific one. Yes, it's here. <laughs> I love her sculptures and wall art in very large quantities with vivid shapes and colors. Her wall pieces gave me an idea of my senior show's installation. Next page, please. Now I'm going to share my BFA senior project. This is a sculpture art practice, so called the Trace of Time. It's inspired by karst topography, which is formed by dissolution of soluble rocks and characterized by underground drainage system with sinkholes and caves, focusing more on how columns are formed when stalagmites and static cities grow and connect. I take columns as a metaphor of connection among my family, my home country, and myself. Could you please go to the next page? My development of this organic form is transforming to a circle as I connect the top and the bottom of stalagmites and stalactites based on its circulation system. 
since changing slowly as time passes, I set personal objects into my sculpture as a medium to deposit my memory. This is similar to formation of columns and having crystal embedded in rocks. Curtis, could you just um, go down really slow? And I think that will match with my, um, my presentation, yes. Um, this is a nice picture. The sculpture was basically made of air dry clay and paper mache. The main reason that I chose these two materials are I can work with them at home, especially during the pandemic. Moreover, I select the inlay objects that based on my memory to my home and hometown and family. My parents collected most of the objects for me and mailed to me from China. And I'm really happy they participated in my senior show in this way. Further, um, I also combine metals with air dry clay to represent the connection and disconnection to my home. Could you please go to the next slide? Next page. Um, here are some images um, of my finished pieces. They're made of air dry clay and casting silver and brown. Sorry, everybody. Um, it's um, I was describing. So I make uh, wearable pieces in silver, it's a ring, and um, I cast organic shape um, in bronze. Yes, it's this one. Um, incorporated with um, air dry clay and uh, metals. Um, to the next page. Um, for my prepara preparation for my installation. Yeah, it's the one with my drawing. I put a lot of thought into my installation. I feel stressful as I have varieties of pieces. I can uh, remember each of them and just randomly put them on the wall. So I started with documenting each pieces on papers drew each one in their real size and then number them. After that, I cut out each of them, organize them on the wall before my exhibition. I tried different composition with paper models easily and took pictures for the one I like. The day of the installation went well. I followed the pictures I took of all the composition. Also, I made different paints to hold different size pieces. Yes. And for the next page, thank you, Curtis. Um, there are some close ups of my show. Um, the largest piece um, I made in um, paper mache. I had um, a frame inside and then covered with paper and then put paper mache around. Could you please go to the next page? Yes. And there are some images of my show. Um, as here you can see, so my show is basically two parts. Could you go, could you go to the next page? Yes. Yes, here. Um, there is a shelf for showing my personal objects that I set into my pieces and our works hang to the wall and to the top of the ceiling. Um, as the, the file that I uploaded to Curtis is a PDF. So Curtis, could you stop sharing and let me share the video for you, for you guys? No, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's so slow, it's not. Um, I think the file is too large. It's not allowing me to advance easily. I'm sorry. Um, can you guys see the video? No, we don't see the no. video. We see some images now. Okay. What about now? Uh, now we see images of your installation. All right. 
Now, can you see me? Images of your installation, yeah. Is it the, can you guys Being see the video? a foreigner often invokes my loneliness. And... No. No, unfortunately, we don't. Okay. Um, what about now? Yes, no? Uh, yes. Okay, um, I'll go start the um, video. Being a foreigner often invokes my loneliness and my sense of belonging to home. While I was creating my pieces, I was allowed to express and release this deep nostalgia. For a long time, I found my memory of past blank. I then tried to collect these fragments of my connection to home. What was the vague image in my mind about home? Is it the city, the culture, or my family? Through the process of making, I gathered the materials and information from home in order to fill in this blank. And yet, it did not result in a concrete form, but an even more vague and abstract image of my home. Here is the one that I work with air dry clay, silk, and cocoon. Great, thank you, Beverly. We have to cut it short, unfortunately, because we're out of time. Um, okay, if yeah, you want to. Um, um, can you guys see this page? The yes. after my graduation plan. Sure, okay. sure, sure. Why don't you finish up real quick? Yeah, after I graduated, I plan to apply for a graduate school in China. Um, and I also want to um, take GI courses. Uh, I think the GI certification is good for my future career. And also, um, I want to sell my own craft um, while I have time. Um, and that's it for my show. Um, special thanks to Professor Curtis, Deb, Marilyn, and our manager, Russell. Yes, yeah, sorry guys um, for the inconvenience of my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Beverly. We invite <laughs> Olivia to join the conversation now. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi. Congrats on all your work and also on overcoming technical difficulties definitely <laughs> sometimes during these virtual meetings and presentations so don't worry about it everybody runs into stuff like this um, I really enjoyed seeing all of your work and I was impressed by how much effort and time was put into your final exhibition I could see there's like a range of scale and material and you really experimented and pushed yourself out of your comfort zone which is um, incredible and I was really drawn to all of those organic forms. And it looks like you did a lot of research into, um, you were talking about topography and how that connects to uh, memory and nostalgia, your family and connections. I found that very compelling as well. So congratulations on that. Um, so you were saying that for your near future, you're thinking about applying to graduate school and then also mm -hmm. getting a certificate from GIA. So are you thinking of continuing making sculpture or like moving into the jewelry field? What is, what are you thinking about? Can you talk about it more? Um, for me, um, I think I don't want to be very commercial. Even I want to sell my own crafts, um, starting my own business, but I want to keep working on more fine arts fields. Um, so I think be sculpture but also wearable pieces um yes okay um so i have another question which is um you were talking about how your parents collected all of this material from your home and then mailed it over to you so you could incorporate into your work how did you select what type of materials for your parents to collect um that's really interesting part because i started my project last semester and I felt really homesickness last semester and I didn't um, talk with my parents during that time. But when I started this project, I realized that I should talk with them. So sometimes I cannot remember everything that um, like travel with my mother. Um, 
and some um, trip with my parents when I was really young. So I started to talk with them um, very often um, for my project. And um, we talked a lot about our trips. And also um, my, my mom took lots of pictures for me um, just um, in our home. Um, my cat and some like teapot, um, what they think about our family culture is. So we talk a lot and my mom really helped me to organize my ideas. Um, and when I talk to, to her, she knows I cannot explain very well um, in Chinese because kind of um, transform from English to Chinese and she kind of understand what I'm trying to say. So yes, um, it's like we talk a, a lot about the materials that I want to use. Yes. Um, that's so interesting. It seems like it was a bit of like a family collaboration in figuring mm -hmm. out the direction you wanted to go in and the materials you wanted to use. Um, I did see you had like silk and silk cocoons and jade. And I think some um, ceramic pieces that I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming is from Chinese culture. Yeah. Is it for, specifically from where you're from, like your home or province, or is it from all over China? Um, I think for cocoon and the silk, it's from Hangzhou, um, the city that I born and raised. Um, so there is a silk um, museum in Hangzhou. And I went there when I was really young um, and started um, the whole process of making silk um, will be showing that museum and also the tree. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, and for the, for the jade, um, one reason is because my mom loves jade of jewelry. Um, and also um, jade um, has really long history um, in China for jade culture. Yes, people started using jade to, jade to make tools at the, at the beginning, and then um, people use jade um, to make jewelry. Yes. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like the silk cocoon for me at least was the most compelling when you combined it with the air dry clay and paper mache perhaps because the forms were really echoing the forms of the, um, the topography that you base the pieces off of, and it felt very cohesive. Um, for some of the other pieces, I felt like, um, like maybe the ceramic or maybe for the jade, they didn't feel as completely integrated into the piece as much as they could. Um, I was thinking perhaps for the ceramic pieces, you, would con you could consider breaking it down into even smaller smaller um, shards and mix it in, mixing it into the whole form to more integrate it into the piece. Um, but I did find it very interesting and it was a very intimate, very intimate work, bring, taking pieces from your everyday life and travels and integrating it into this thing. Um, I feel like there are a couple different artists you could look at. Uh, one of them is Susie Gonch. So she's known for taking things like plastic and turning it into artwork. She collects large amounts and puts them all together. And um, it's really just everyday materials like plastic coffee lids or plastic bags, and then really working with it and creating large scale sculptures. I feel like that might be something you would be interested in looking at. And then there's also Jillian Moore. And again, I'll email you all these names in case you're not sure how to spell them. So Jillian Moore, she's inspired by organisms and like cellular structures, very organic like your work, but she uses a lot of bright colors and resin and also um, insulation foam. So maybe that's something you could think about too, creating the core of your pieces with insulation form, foam and then adding the dry clay on top of that that might help you create larger, lighter pieces. And then there's also Lauren Fensterstock. And her, I, I thought about her work because um, your, in your thesis exhibition, it really created a environment. You have so many pieces kind of hanging on the wall 
it filled up the space and created kind of an alternate reality. And that's what Lauren Fensterstock, Stark, Fensterstock does really, really well. And she also uses a wide range of materials. So for example, um, she uses things like paper and mosaic and beads and cement, just all different types of materials, but they all come together really nicely in one cohesive piece. Um, and she, I think, would be a great person to study for creating kind of an environment within the gallery space. And then finally, one more person, um, Angela Hennessy, who I think teaches at CCA, not sure if she still, still does, but she studied metals and textiles. And what she does is she takes uh, synthetic hair or real hair or other textile materials that look like hair and braids and weaves and works with that to create work that is inspired by memory, nostalgia, ancestry, grief, loss, um, things that you also touch on yourself. And it mm -hmm. feels very, um, her work is very, feels very intimate and really draws you in. So these are a couple of artists that I think you might enjoy looking at. Thank you, Olivia. Um, I just um, catch the first two, um, name of the artist. Could you, could you um, send me the last two? Um, yeah, name of artist. Yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much and congratulations, Beverly. Um, for Marilyn De Silva, Professor Marilyn De Silva is going to, oh, excuse me, Deb Logier is going to introduce our next uh, presenter. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Curtis. Okay, Mitchell Shim was born in Sydney, Australia, but spent his last two years of high school in South Korea. This contrast of cultures and heritage has instilled a unique perspective his Australian accent, an early indication that all may not be as it appears. I have had the pleasure of working with Mitchell in three courses, our first one being Jewelry Metal Arts One. He was quiet and hesitant at first, choosing a bench at the perimeter of the room, looking outward towards his thoughts. But when he opened up his sketchbook mid-semester to give me a look inside, I was in awe. You have been holding back, I told him. I want more and more is what he has continued to give. Interesting forms, surfaces and compositions, characters from another place filled with emotion and quirky charm. I think they are all self portraits revealing to us who he is from the inside out. He listens intensely, taking everything in like a sponge, trusting with abandon that my guidance is leading him in the right direction. When asked about his favorite CCA memory, Mitchell wrote, it was the last critique of my jewelry class. I had very low confidence in the artworks that I was making, considering CCA was my first time ever to solely focus on art. However, after my last critique, incorporating skills that I had learned so far, it was emotional to hear positive feedback from fellow classmates and professors. This allowed me to prioritize my vision and passion, made me more confident, allowing me to enjoy the process of making art. The power of this connection, teacher to student, is never lost on me, but his heartfelt response gave me pause. Mitchell, you inspire me. May you continue to grow and flourish as an artist while protecting this vulnerable and open heart it is with such a pleasure and honor to both celebrate and introduce Mitchell Shin. Hello guys. Thank you Deb for those wonderful messages. I really appreciate them. I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you guys uh, see my screen? All right, sounds good. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Mitchell Shim and welcome to my senior thesis conversation. Uh, to begin, I will talk about my short introduction to you guys um, so you can know me well. So to begin, uh, I was born in Sydney, Australia and lived most of my life there. Uh, later in my life, I transitioned to Korea to finish off the rest of my high school education before coming to CCA. 
I believe I've always had an interest in creating craft as a child from early on, from making objects from household materials inspired by movies I watched growing up. I think what gives me an interest in art is motivated by my past experiences in Australia and Korea. I believe the naturistic theme of flowers is derived from my upbringing in Australia, which is quite evident in the pieces I've made so far. The industrial aspect of Korea is what influenced me to portray the geometric aspect in my works, in addition to keep experimenting with other materials as well. My inspiration mostly comes from colors and the concept of abstraction and its abnormality towards life. Colors are influential to me as they ignite emotions through the spectrum of colors that dictate our mood in everyday life. It gives me pleasure and causes certain reactions through my eyes and mind that words cannot ex express. Jean Basquiat is a Brooklyn-based artist who has been a predominant influence in my practices as his way of flowing with the canvas, allowing a sense of freedom in the strokes of his paintings really influenced me to obtain a level of sanity to be freer in my studio practices. Indoseni Kaski is a Mexican muralist who I've managed to take influence from their abstract perception of the anatomical structure of the human body. Hugo Rondinone is a Swiss born artist who I've also been influenced by, by the odd structural and vibrant colors he depicts in his artworks of different mediums he mastered over the years. Also challenging me to expand on the idea of consisting different mediums of materials and skills in my work. The first piece I want to talk about is a piece that I made in my first year here at CCA, taking my major class. This piece is important to me as it depicts the relationship between the naturistic and industrial concept of my upbringing as a child. The flower and geometric cubicle body are a reminder of the connection between the difference in my experiences in both cultures. The evident brushstrokes on the surface of the piece also depict the theme of freedom influenced by paintings by Jean Basquiat. The second piece I wanna show you is a piece called Emotions, created in my second year here at CCA. This project was special to me as it helped build my skills as a metal smithing student to a great degree of managing time and learning skills about myself that I have not yet experienced yet. This piece has a bank mechanism, which the deposit is depicted through words that is put inside the mouth and later being transferred to flowers and colors once opening up the chest of the robot. This project is a piece that was made right before the pandemic, which I think shows the themes I produce in the concept of jewelry making. The past slide showed more of a conceptual aspect of my practices in metal smithing, whereas in this slide, I want to share what kind of jewelry pieces interest me to create. This is a brooch piece that has an opening mechanism in the wings revealing a heart shaped stone embedded inside the bird. I still think the naturistic aspect and geometric concept are still evident in my jewelry, jewelry pieces, which I would love to expand in my future practices. Moving on to this slide, I'm gonna talk about my senior exhibition um, that happened in March. The title of the exhibition spectrum reflects on the range of emotions I personally felt during the pandemic. I wasn't able to find the right alternative to release these feelings until the opportunity to truly express myself and my passion with materials in this exhibition. The title spectrum insinuates on the spectrum of emotions and skills harnessed from my experiences reflected onto this exhibition also. And here is my artist statement. I will read it to you guys. My art, my craft, my emotions run wild, yet they are concealed by society. My colors are open, yet they fight for right and wrong. My hands are expressive, yet they are entangled by my mind. My mind is free, yet encapsulated by my ego. Who does freedom really belong to? Does freedom belong within art? So the first piece in my show I wanna show you guys is a mixed media painting um, incorporating skills outside of my major, such as painting and ceramics. This painting is 24 inches by 30 inches and is surrounded by plain colored orbs surrounding the canvas. And here's some more in-depth photos of the piece. The eyeballs um, indicate the perception we consume in motion, which is mostly to the sense of our eyes. The colors suggest the natural gradient of colors that emotion depict ranging from the spectrum of sensations in our minds. 
The second series of pieces are my head sculptures and paintings. These series of works are also incorporated by my practices in ceramics, paintings, and metal. These headpieces are a mere reflection of myself expressed through objects replicating my sensation. In connection to it, the paintings above illustrate the color my mind experiences when these emotions take over my body. This object that I created is called Peace. I made this in relation to the dimension and the meaning of cubes to me. Cubes, for instance, obtain the validity of maintaining the same surface whichever way it is turned making the sensation of being in a stable state of mind. The right angled edges hold, also hold the significant feeling of stability whenever I look at building structures or tables from everyday life. This next piece is called sad. This piece shows the imagery of my headspace when I'm emotionless due to sadness indicated by the bubbles accumulated in my mind. The water taps also is a slight metaphor for our tears dropping, which is displayed by the three water taps sprouting from, his head, from this headpiece. For the texture of the metal taps, I wanted to express sadness through flowers and the naturistic connection I have in my works. With this in mind, I depicted a dying flower covered in flame painting, created the, creating the feeling of being damaged and being left behind. For my final headpiece, the title of this object is called Confused. This emotion is directly connected to the emotion I felt while adjusting to everything that accumulated for such a short amount of time. For this inspiration, I decided to depict the cerebral activity of a psychedelic trip that illustrates our minds being all over the place, not really being aware of our surroundings and being concealed by our minds. For this imagery to be produced into reality, I related to a mushroom trip, dictating the certain emotion to be created. Now, this was my final piece for the show, and I hope you guys enjoyed this journey as I did with you guys. And I just wanna say thank you um, to everyone that motivated me and supported me through this journey in my life. Deb, Marilyn, Curtis, Russell, Joanne, and David, you guys have been the absolute best gems in my life. I have become more self-aware through metalsmithing and the jewelry family being always able to support one another. It will be difficult to find anything like this and I'm glad I could experience it with you all for the four years of my life. It will be hard saying goodbye, but I will never forget you guys and hope you guys don't forget about me. I love you all and hope to see what life has in store for each and every one of you. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Congratulations on all the great work. Um, now, if Olivia could join us again, that would be fantastic. Hello. Hello. Hi, congrats on your work. And Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed your use of surrealism and assemblage within your work. Um, one of the pieces that drew me in immediately was your cube bird, I think it's called, um, because you had that rigid kind of shape. You have the soft wings and the kind of stick legs and the flower and everything coming together. And it's very whimsical and loose. And there's like room to think about it. And um, it was just, for me, at least very compelling. And it combined, I think it was your interpretation and you taking on your inspirations and putting it into one piece. So, um, I do want to ask, what are your short-term and long-term plans for the future? Uh, yeah, so I didn't put the future plans in because I, because I was kind of like waiting for my um, OPT, and it just got approved. So, I guess my short-term uh, plan is most likely trying to apply for jobs, um, just get a little bit of experience. But um, currently, I don't have any plans for long-term uh, for me. Yeah. So, are you thinking about? Um, learning more within like the sculpture field or maybe in the jewelry field, like which one, which type of direction? Um, I was really like kind of leaning towards a museum because in that sense, I could kind of like look at and perceive like different kind of materials and sculptures, jewelry, paintings, and all kind of, I guess, all at once. So mm -hmm. I think that's like kind of what I'm leaning towards right now. Okay. 
So um, I thought your work is very interesting. And I love how you use different materials and you kind of push them to your limits. Um, there, there's like an interesting tension between for your thesis work between the metal work and the ceramic work. Um, and there's also like the glazed and the unglazed happening. Um, I, I wish that you had gone even further because mm -hmm. I could see kind of like maximalist tendencies, but it felt like you were kind of holding back a little bit. And I would have loved to see some, like something kind of explode out of the heads. Um, I think specifically, especially for the one that was about confusion, it felt like the psychedelicness was there, but it was very close within the skull. And if it could like overflow, that would be very interesting or even like shoot up like a foot or, or two feet high. That would be, um, I think more compelling. But with like the um, restriction of materials and time and equipment that you had, that was very impressive for you to work in different materials. And um, I was also kind of drawn to the painting that you did. You said that you like materials that you were as familiar, familiar with the ceramic and the painting, but in it, I feel like you found more flow and more freedom and you were a little looser with that. And with the pieces in metal and ceramic, maybe because you were more focused on executing an idea or tackling the technical aspects, it was a little more constrained. And I would love to see you continue working on the concept that maybe go a little bit looser, like let yourself have more fun. And maybe, I don't know, maybe fail, maybe make some mistakes. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of artists that I would love to um, recommend to you. One is Woody Othello. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him. He actually went to CCA for his MFA and he graduated 2017. So he works mostly with clay and his pieces have this kind of very loose feeling to them. And there's like a surrealism. He combines like hands with faces or like um, makes these extremely large telephone sets out of ceramic. Um, and I think his use of movement and flow you would benefit from looking at his work. I think another thing, well, another reason why I'm thinking about Woody Othello is that even though he makes a lot of different objects, all types of different objects or body parts. Um, there is a cohesiveness. There's like a similar visual vocabulary that runs throughout his work. And for your thesis work, um, there is a little bit of disjointedness between the three different elements, the glazed ceramic, unglazed ceramic, and the metal. And I'm wondering if that could be worked with if you played with color more. Um, is there a reason why you decided to have the unglazed ceramic, just like the clay color and not add, add additional color to it? Yeah, for the, for the head sculpts, for the main part, I just wanted a, a composition between uh, a glazed kind of shiny part in comparison to like a normal ceramics like um, surface, kind of that raw kind of material. And then you have another um, contrast, which is the metal. So that's, that's why I was trying to like uh, incorporate like the different kind of, I guess, materials like you can like see as an audience member. So is it important to you to have the glaze ceramic and the metal um, textures and colors very distinct, like very separate from each other? Um, at that time, I thought it was important because I just didn't want the whole piece just to be in like, I guess, just one color, if, if you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess um, in that sense, I was trying to, I, I was trying to like um, make this materials different, but um, yeah, I could, I could start like experimenting more on the colors and the um, surface of the ceramics that you mentioned. I, I feel like this is very interesting because this is also a push and pull that I dealt with when I was making work at CCA mm. as well, which is sometimes you want to work in metal or you want to work in ceramics, but it's not um, the exact right thing to be used within a project, or maybe you have to sacrifice certain elements that you love to make the piece more cohesive. Um, I felt like this; those headpieces were a great demonstration of your skill set, your ability to play with color and form. But maybe not all of them. You didn't need to have all of them within one piece, or maybe you should go the other direction and add more. Like just throw everything on it and see what happens. 
And uh, one more ceramic artist, Sarah Catapano. She makes these um, fantastical kind of creatures that are biomorphic and there's a lot of like pull and push, but there's also air to breathe within her pieces. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a lot of color as well. So this would be a great person for you to look at. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, that was great. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mesli Mercado. Um, Mesli Mercado was born in the year of the golden dragon. Uh, this golden dragon flourish in the everywhere all at once maximalist environment of San Francisco, where she was born and raised with a Nicoya mother and a Mexicano father. She's inspired by the colors and the shapes in her natural environment of both the 23rd and Mission area of San Francisco and in Mexico where she visited her family every summer. Her parents never said no to her as a child and this helped nurture her creativity and her crea uh, curiosity. When she was five, her mother left her alone with the sewing machine and this led uh, to a passion for her sewing and making wearable objects. After her taking her first metal class during her freshman year at CCA, she felt that she found the supportive creative community where she could indulge her obsession with detail. I'm so thrilled that she took that metals class. Her first metal project was a four inch copper fly and now she's built a swarm of flies out of silver, beads, leather, pearls, and brass. She wants to, con she wants to continue to create jewelry work and enlarge her swarm of flies. The connection to the flies and her mother is unbreakable and growing this collection will likely never stop. We'll hear more about those connections and the big fly in her presentation. I appreciate that she uses her personal and cultural histories to honor family connections and preserve lived experience within her work. Mesli attended Ruth Asawa School of the Arts in technical theater and costume design. This is a public arts high school in San Francisco for students with experience in their chosen crafts who audition in order to attend. She believes it's crucial that arts education is accessible and not completely privatized or a thing of privilege. Uh, Metzli is committed to her community and she plans to become an art teacher in elementary or middle school so she can help make art available to all students in public schools. I'm sure she's going to be a fantastic art teacher. Um, Metzli, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, I look forward to your presentation and I look forward to seeing how your career grows. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so, ooh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I, yeah, let me get on and share my screen. Uh, so um, my name is Mesli. I'm a senior here at the Jewelry and Metal Arts Department at uh, CCA. Um, I'm a designer from San Francisco. Um, and as Curtis mentioned, I'm from specifically the Mission District where I spent summers in Mexico. Um, I feel that both of these played a big part of um, the colors that I use in a lot of my work. Um, and um, that would not be possible without my parents who um, are immigrants here. I'm, I'm a proud second generation and um, yeah, they, they're really supportive and allowed me to really view um, art as the career option that I wanted to go into. And without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, so um, I can start off with the intrepid fly. Um, so the intrepid fly has been a motif that I've explored for several years. And although it's been long, it's long been a symbol of strength for me. It was only after my mother's death that it became essential. Flies are my messengers. They are my helpers now. And in many ways, my mother reminds me of the story of the big fly from the Navajo people. I think about how the sand painters have their helper and protector, the fly. My mother is my big fly. I like to believe she still sits on my shoulder and looks over me while I work. She's my collaborator, 
On every piece I make and on every fly, I set free to become someone else's helper. Um, so this leads into my first um, installment of Los Mesanjeros, which translates to the messengers in Spanish. Um, during the pandemic, I had to explore a different way of um, jewelry making aside from, you know, metalwork. And I took up beading, which really helped me um, get out of the like strict mindset of rules and really helped me explore color in a way in jewelry that I had never explored. Um, and yeah, and so these, oh, sorry. And so these are my messengers. They are my helpers now. And in many ways, my mother reminds, oh, flies are constantly looked down upon. Modern Western cultures often associate flies with all things dirty, rotten, and vile, and with death. These cultures fear death, and Latin America and indigenous cultures, death is viewed differently. The line between earth, life, and afterlife is more permeable. We celebrate death. The life of those we have lost and to us flies are a symbol of resilience and they are survivors. Um, so these are made with freshwater pearls, glass seed beads, um, and they're backed with genuine leather. Um, yeah. And so I explored a lot of beadwork during the pandemic because like I said, it was a way of tapping into my indigenous heritage. And so, um, because my grandfather is from um, indigenous from California and my dad is indigenous from Mexico. This is inspired by um, a milagro, which is traditional in Mexican culture to hang in your house. Um, and it translates to, um, tr it translates to um, a miracle and it is a way of protection. So, oh, and then I venture into um, pieces that really tie into my mother. So this is, these are brass earrings inspired by Oaxacan metalwork. Um, they're frames to show the features that um, she very <laughs> beautifully passed down to me. Um, here I am wearing them. Um, these are earrings made from brass and silver and lapis lazuli teardrops. My mother bought these teardrops um, at a local gem fair and had plans on making them into earrings, but unfortunately never got around to. Um, and she loved, she had a whole collection of eye earrings. So I really wanted to incorporate them in a way uh, that I knew she would wear them. So um, I made fly or eye earrings. Um, and then I started exploring um, the aspect of who was there after my mom's death. And I am very fortunate that um, my intentional family um, was there to pick up the pieces. My aunts consist of my mom's best friends and my grandparents are my mom's adoptive parents after she immigrated here from Latin America. And um, I asked each of them to choose five objects to give to me so that I could reimagine them into jewelry. And one of my aunts, Titi Kristen, chose this seed and cobalt blue beads that I then set um, in silver with an accent of a cobalt blue enameled flower. Here she is modeling it. Um, it's inspired by Mexican silver work from Tasco, Mexico. Um, I asked my dad to give me five objects as well, and he brought me back um, these all this plethora of stones from Ocean Beach, which I visited a lot as a child. Um, and he explained to me that he really liked being able to see the wear of time on these on all of these little trinkets that he got. And um, I really wanted to incorporate the ocean in this piece, so. I made a serpent starfish and it's like a green stone. So he chose the accent stone of pink um, and here he is wearing it. Um, it was really important to me that my family members wear these pieces. And this is a piece for my other aunt, Titi Clau, um, with silver 
a, a seashell that she found um, and uh, pearls and amethyst. Um, I, this piece is really special because it was an exploration of different techniques that I could use with silver, um, as well as stone setting. It was something that I hadn't really done before and um, I really wanted to experiment. Here she is wearing it. It also has a stone, um, a seashell from one of my mother's earrings because Titi Klau was actually my mom's best friend. And I wanted her to be able to have a aspect of her to carry around. Um, and then this piece is for my grandfather. He chose to give me out of his five objects. Um, he gave me tree sap, which is this in the middle and um, a marble from his childhood. And I really love how I was able to incorporate these. Um, it's citrine, brass, the glass marble, um, and a stone from Ocean Beach that my dad also found. So it's kind of like a paternal necklace. Um, and I then set a fly as a protector. Um, this tree sap is, has medicinal properties and um, he's from the Wailaki Nation. And um, in his culture, if you burn it, it you know, sends out good energy. So, and here he is um, wearing it. Um, and um, I just want to end with um, a little piece of my mom's journal that she left for me after she passed and um, a picture of me in her belly. I'm the fly. And uh, yeah, I'm, she, she was really important to me. And I'm really happy that I was able to bring everything together. Um, and she really was the nucleus of my family because without her, I wouldn't know my aunts and I wouldn't know my, you know, my grandparents because they were chosen family. And uh, I really appreciate that, that I can have so much in common with them. Um, and my contact info, if you wanna see more of my work um, or look at it for longer, um, is at www.mesley.me. Um, you can also see my uh, sewing work there, um, or you can see me at uh, mez.marize on Instagram, or you can message me at info at mesley.me. Um, and yeah, thank you all for listening and being here. I also just wanted to say that my show is next week, April 27th through 29th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if uh, you're able to, please, please come by. It's gonna be at the Hubble Street Galleries um, I'm at space 151 Hubble Street. Yes, so thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Lee. Um, now we invite Olivia to join us again. Thank you so, for the great presentation. Hello. Hi, um, congrats on your work. I found the colors and the way you modeled jewelry, like the, the model shots, to be very, very compelling. I think one of your strengths is really like showing the, your work on the person and having that connection between the person and the work. Mm -hmm. um, and also I feel like the, the backgrounds, whether they be nature or like a, a solid color, they all went really well together. It was a very um, compelling image and it felt intimate and there was emotion in it. So um, I did wanna ask you, you said that you're plan is to become an art teacher. Are you also planning on continuing to make jewelry? And if yes, are you thinking about custom one of a kind or production work? What do you think? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really, my goal is to become an art teacher. Um, but I definitely want to continue jewelry work um, for possibility I would love to attend CCA for their master's program um, and my big goal is to continue the flies especially the beaded flies just because um, they're the most um, they're, they're faster to make than the metal flies um, but they still have as much color and as much like they have a lot to do with my cultural background. And it's really important to me that the flies are kind of set free to other people. Um, so that's my main 
short-term goal for now. <laughs> Got it. Um, so that's great. In terms of kind of like production work, like making multiples for the flies, um, it will, one of your challenges will probably be figuring out how to make things fast enough in order for you to make a profit, especially with eating since it's, it's more time con consuming. But of course, if you're really good at it, you're able to like knock them out really quickly. Um, but I think you have, you probably have a great audience out there that would appreciate the colors and the motifs that you use in your work. I love the flies personally. Um, with those earrings, the only thing I would say is that maybe pay a little more attention to the trimming of the leather on the outside. I feel like there were one or two pieces where the leather was a little uneven, or you can make it a part of your work to have that leather come out and to have it kind of like flow outside of the outline of the fly that potentially could be part of your signature look. And then, um, so you're not thinking about making more one-of-a-kind pieces based on things that people give you? I definitely would love to continue this series. Um, a, I think like found object art and also just having, I think for me, uh, jewelry is something that is really special. And I think a lot of it becomes heirlooms. And I think about a lot of the things that are my mom, you know, got from her grandparents. And I think about how now I have them after she's passed and being able to incorporate you know, something, you know, like a seed in my work um, mm -hmm. and then having that be something that becomes an heirloom, but it's set really beautifully. It's really important to me. And so I would really love to continue that work. And um, I feel like that's what jewelry is about. And uh, yeah. Got it. Um, so in, in that case, there is definitely a market for that as well, making custom work and taking perhaps heirlooms or um, souvenirs that people, people's loved ones have left them and taking a reimagining it into jewelry, definitely a place for that. And um, I also wanted to ask you, would you consider like incorporating more material, like different materials into your work, specifically with the flies? Um, I saw that you use like leather and beads, but what about things like mother of pearl or stone that you've cut yourself or velvet or just different textures? Yeah, I have um, I have other pieces that are gonna be at my show that I have incorporated mother of pearl and um, some are specifically like, I did, a, I did a pair of earrings that are fly earrings that actually have um, wicholing, like wichol beadwork techniques, which, um, basically means that instead of being sewn into something, it has been, there's a layer of like adhesive and then you press it into the adhesive. Um, and so I have these brass fly and brass and silver fly earrings that I have done that um, method too. And uh, I definitely have cut stones that I am planning to use, but I just haven't gotten around to it. <laughs> Yeah, I could definitely see because you used, um, like you were talking about uh, found stones or tree sap, I think you were saying, and the seeds and all these different materials from the ground and incorporating into your work. I'd love to see more of that. And if you do venture into lapidary, that will give you more freedom with working with the stones. Um, I have a friend who's also a jewelry designer and maker. And I know that she took her silversmithing and lapidary classes in Mexico. And perhaps that is something you could explore when you have time. Um, so a couple of artists that I would recommend to you is, first one is Brianna Ferreira. Um, she uses, utilizes a lot of beadwork. Her work is very colorful and maximalist. And she makes a range of items. So from like wall hangings to um, objects, to earrings, to bookmarks, to um, beaded bouquets even, uh, there is a wide range of things that she makes, a great person to look at. The next one is Susan Alexandra, um, who does beaded purses. So she's more fashion centric, fashion oriented. Um, and she has a very signature look that once you see a product of hers, you know it's hers. 
The next person is Alkimila Jewelry. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But what she does is she creates um, kind of bronze structures and then has beads in between. And I'm pretty sure that she makes the bronze structures by working the wax and then casting them. So there's a combination between the beads, beadwork and line work. And she also uses a lot of different colors. And then finally, there's Catherine Blackburn, who is an indigenous jewelry designer and maker. And she takes the traditional beadwork and then she really infuses her own kind of modern aesthetic and sensibility into that work. And um, she makes a wide range of items from really small earrings to really large kind of shield body armor shield pieces that are more sculptural. So these are four artists that I think you would benefit, for, benefit from looking at and studying. And I would also, um, I don't know if you've done this, but it would be great if you could look even more into flies. Like you were talking about the big fly. And then, so like myths around flies, research around flies, getting to know the fly like on a very intimate level and then bring some of that detail and knowledge into your work, I think would give you like a, a narrative that's sp specific to you and specific to your work. Yeah. But again, um, congratulations on what you've accomplished so far. And I look forward to seeing what you come up with in the future. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much everybody. That um, concludes our event. Thank you so much Olivia Schiff for uh, moderating. Uh, congratulations to Olivia Wang and Beverly and Mitchell and Nestle. Um, we're so proud of you guys, you did so great. That's so wonderful to hear about your work and uh, see how it's progressed over the years. Um, I want to say a special thank you to all our faculty who are here, Marilyn De Silva, Deb Shear, David Cole, Joanne Donovan. Special thanks to Russ Larman, our amazing studio manager who runs the, the tight ship that we, we carry through. Um, Ava Morton, who is our program manager um, in the fine arts office as well. Thank you everybody so much for attending today and showing up. Um, I'll stick around for a little while so we can just say kind of goodbye to each other, but that concludes our event for today. Thank you. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, really great. Really great. Really good. Yeah.